Before we get into the word, I do want to say thank you so much for our family being here today. We have Angela's parents, Colin and Carol, seated up here. We're so glad that you guys made it this morning. And of course, we've got Jacob's parents and his brother and his sister must be out in kids' church. So glad that you guys came and um, taking the time today. And of course, my parents are always here, right? <laughs> and kids. We're continuing a series about living a meaningful life. Living a meaningful life. A life that matters. A life that others can count on. A life that is committed. Meaningful. Can you say at this point that your life has been meaningful? Can you say that you're living a meaningful life? So this series has been really, really something that's been even challenging to me as I move forward in my life. The changes that have taken place in my life. Am I going to continue to live a meaningful life? And these decisions have to be made. Otherwise, by default, you're not going to live a meaningful life. You have to choose every day to be meaningful. So today what I want to talk with you about is your life's direction. Are you gradually getting better or are you gradually getting worse? Can you say that you're headed in the right direction? Or can you say, man, my life isn't where it should be. Would you say that you're a better person now than you were a year ago? Gauge your life now compared to a year ago. Some of you are like, yeah, but maybe that's not you. Would you say that the temptations that you face, that you're stronger to face those temptations now than you were a year ago? Are you still battling the same temptations that you battled when you were a teenager or even a child? Or have you grown? Are you better? What are your weaknesses? Do they handicap you more now than ever? Look at your relationships. Would you say that your relationships are stronger, better, weaker, or worse than they were a year ago? You see, these are the tests of life that we can look back and we can say, wow, am I on the right direction? Am I heading the right direction? Ask yourself, what direction am I headed in this life? And you can look back just one year's time to see, have I been, become better in these areas of my life? Am I headed the right direction? That's how you know if you're headed the right direction. If your life were to be mapped out, what would that look like? So what is the ultimate goal of life? You can find all these other purposes and all these other reasons to live. But here is the ultimate goal of life. If you're looking, looking for purpose, if you're looking for the meaning of life, if you're looking for why am I here, there's one thing. I've got the answer. You can believe it or not, or you can go home and still try other things. It's your business. But here is the answer. The one thing that's worth doing in this life that brings meaning to your life, the ultimate goal in life, is to have a mature relationship with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. A growing, maturing relationship and ultimately to have that mature relationship. Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12, it's it's the well-trained who find themselves mature in their relationship with God. You think, well, what is all this pain about? What is all this struggle about? Why am I going through so much in this life? I don't understand. It's it's training you is what it is. And it's the well-trained that come to a place where they have this relationship with God. Your ultimate purpose in living is a meaningful relationship with God. Well, John, I've I've got my family, I've got my job, I've got my career, I've got all of these things going on in my life, and I really just want to focus on them. I've I've got all my toys and whatever it is that you focused your life on. But ultimately, the question is, and those things aren't bad, obviously. Those things can be a part of it, and God's relationship with you can make those things better. Even your hobbies. Some won't ever get this because they don't believe in Jesus. So here's what this looks like. So we're going to show a few charts today. Um, this is what it looks like, you know, just, just in, in our context of what we're talking about today. See the flat line across the bottom, the red line? That's a life from start to finish without Christ. 
just dead spiritually, all right? And in these charts, if you look over to the, to the left side, there's the number 12. So we go up, we want to shoot for 12, right? Uh, 12, is, honestly, it was kind of random, but, you know, if you want to spiritualize it because we need to, 12 is a really important number in the Bible. So we'll use that, right? So if 12 is the mature relationship with God, that's what we want to get after. So it's a, but without Christ... You're dead spiritually. It's a constant beep, just beep for the rest of, for all of your life spiritually. So the people that I run into that don't have Christ in their lives, it's not that they don't necessarily know the story. It's not that they haven't heard of Jesus or heard something about him forgiving our sins and the need of, of that in our lives. It's not that they haven't heard of that. It's just basically they don't want to change their lives. I was I was uh, doing some marital counseling with a couple one time. They were really struggling in their marriage. And I, I began to ask them about their relationship with God. And they told me, look, we're atheists. We don't believe in God. I said, okay, well, do you mind if I share a few things along the way? Because there's some tips and, and things that, you know, God teaches us about relationships. Whether you believe in them or not, they're great information. So I found a way to start being able to communicate Christ to them. And so they opened the door. As I got 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 into it deeper and deeper we got to a place where it was like oh man okay he's really starting to twist some screws here this is really starting to make too much sense and finally the guy stopped me he said okay okay hold on preacher the truth is it's not that we don't believe in god it's that we don't want to change our lives because we're doing things that we don't want to stop doing i said oh whew. Well, good. Whew. That relieves me because when somebody tells me they don't believe in God, that means that they actually are a little bit crazy because that means they think they've gone behind every star and, and to the depths of the oceans and behind every rock and they found that there is no God. So I'm so pleasantly surprised that you're able to say the reason you don't believe in God or that's what you choose to say is because you just don't want to change your life. That's far more reasonable to understand. Great. By the way, when you decide that you can maybe believe in God, it will help your marriage. Okay. So perhaps, though, that's, that's not you. Perhaps your pursuit of a mature relationship with God looks more like this. You were going along for a while. You were below a one. You were down there where the, the heartbeat is, is beep, right? And then all of a sudden you accepted Christ. Maybe when you were a teenager and you went up to a two. And you just kind of stayed there for the rest of your life at this point. You just kind of stayed there, wavered, went to church, didn't go to church, went to church, didn't go to church, prayed a little bit, got excited, went to some kind of camp or something, did whatever. And you just kind of stayed there. You're alive in Christ, but barely alive in Christ. You know what I'm saying? Many people who accept Christ never embrace the concept that the goal is is a mature relationship with him. That's what we're shooting for. That's what you and I need. And to be honest with you, that's where our lives will grow. That's where our sanity will come from. That's where peace will come from. That's where daily purpose and meaning in our lives comes from. And what greater meaning and purpose can we embrace than one that the almighty God, the creator of the universe says, hey, I've got a purpose for you. I've got a reason for you to be here. I want you to join me in this purpose and I want you to be a part of it. What greater could we find? There is none. So maturity is the result of growth. The key of growing in Christ is to check your direction. What direction are you heading today? Can you say you're heading the right direction? Are you on the right path? Well, just simply look at the last year of your life. What are the results of the last year of your life? Well, here's the good news. You're in church today. That's good direction, isn't it? That's a good place to be. It's good. One of the benefits of being in a church every week is you're getting information Put in your head. You're eating something spiritually, right? You're using your brain. You got right thinking because of it. And, you've, and I, I've seen this through the years. The people that, the, that, that I visit, the people that I talk with throughout the week, all throughout the week, the people that I visit with, if they're strong believers and they're in church week after week after week, it's amazing how their life flourishes so much differently. And the attitude of life is so much different. It changes us. And it brings meaning to us. 
And I see them walk through the pains of their lives in so many different ways than the people that don't. Even even people that say they believe they're maybe at a two. They're struggling more and more with the problems and difficulties of life than the people that truly have become mature in Christ. You see, when you grow into maturity in Christ, it doesn't matter what hits you. You're going to be able to stay the course. And you're going to have meaning in your life. And you're going to see it no matter how difficult the pain in your life is. You see, although our physical bodies are important and our mental capacity is important, at some point, those things are going to be leave, are going to be dust, aren't they? But what's not? Your spiritual body. The real you. So our relationship with God is the absolute most important part of life. Your relationship with God is the absolute most important part of your life. I got two amens. Your relationship with Christ is the absolute most important part of your life. First Timothy chapter four. Paul said this. Exercise daily in God. I hate when someone asks me, how many days a week do you exercise? Because up until recently, it was none. How many days a week do you exercise spiritually? Praying. Doing a devotion. Bodybuilding, spiritual bodybuilding. He says, exercise daily in God. No spiritual flabbiness, please. Oh, man, Paul, seriously. Workouts in the gymnasium are useful, but a disciplined life in God is far more so. Making you fit both today and forever. You can count on this. Take it to heart. This is why we've thrown ourselves into this venture so totally. He says, guys, you don't understand what, what, what I'm trying to convey here is this is worth giving your complete life to, your attention to, everything in your life can be poured into this and you'll never regret it. This is why we've given ourselves, we've thrown ourselves into this venture so totally. He's sitting in jail writing this letter. And he says, I've thrown my life into this. We're banking on the living God, Savior of all men and women, especially believers. So a mature relationship with God is our purpose for living Growing to that mature relationship with God. And it's our only real hope in life. So let me ask you this. Why do we even consider it an option that we don't? Well, John, that's for you. Growing up spiritually, that's for you. I just want to get to heaven. I just want to be a two for the rest of my life. I don't really aspire to have any kind of... I don't really need to hear from God every day. And if I do, it's just to to meet my needs and whatever I need to do. That's not for me. I don't want to really grow to be some spiritual guru. I'm not asking you to be a spiritual guru. I'm asking you to consider growing in a relationship with God to a place where you can say, all right, I know him and he knows me. And I know that I'm heading the right direction. Even when you don't feel it. I was talking with a lady a while ago and I asked her the question, hey, how are you doing? How's your relationship with God? She said, well, it could be better. I said, "Okay, well, are you going to grow closer to him? I mean, this is your choice, right? She said, well, no, I I, I need to, but I think I'll get started next week. (laughs) I just kind of smiled at her. I said, well, do you mind if I ask why? Why not today? She said, well... I'm going to Vegas with my boyfriend for the weekend. I got you. When I saw her a couple of weeks later, she teared up. And she said, that was the biggest mistake of my life. God gave her an option before she made this huge mistake. He gave her an out. And maybe today this is your out. 
before you make the biggest mistake of your life, maybe this is that moment that God is giving you to say, you know what, I need to get on the right direction today. I don't need to wait till next week. I don't need to get this last wild oat so so you guys know what I mean. Sown. I don't need to do that. I need to do it today. And I'm going to live the rest of my life for him. Here's what's interesting about a mature relationship with God. Jesus taught that the be- to begin the road to a mature relationship with God, we've got to become little children. This is where you begin. You become like a little child. What did he mean? He said this, I'm telling you the truth. And this is a beautiful story because Jesus is there and there's all these people that are there. And, and Jesus points to this kid and he's like, hey, kid, come here. Come here, kid. I don't know how old the kid was, but the kid comes over and Jesus, I don't know if he sat down or what, but he had the kid and he said, you guys see this kid? I'm telling you once and for all that unless you return to square one and start over like little children, you're not even going to look at the kingdom of God, let alone get in. Whoever becomes simple and elemental, like elementary, like this child, will rank high in the kingdom of God. What is he talking about? What do you think he's talking about? You can answer if you want. Growing to spiritual maturity. But it starts here. What does he mean becoming like a child? Being born again. Simplicity. Just one step at a time, just like a child. Trust. Who said trust? Oh, very good, Linda. Cindy, sorry. Cindy's Linda's behind you. <laughs> I know, we got Linda's. Trust. What else? Get rid of everything you think you already know. Oh, that's good, Amy. Utter dependence. Is that what? Dependent upon, upon Him. That's right, Sandy. Knowing He loves us, right? Knowing we, we belong to Him. You know, when children just know they belong to their parents and are loved by their parents. How wonderful a thing that is, right? You know, and and children just believe. They don't complicate things. When someone says, I love you, children's just like, okay. And when children are taught something, they're like, oh, that's cool. How many of you remember the little felt things that your Sunday school teacher would have had when you were a kid and they would put it up on the board and stuff? Now we have videos. and But then it was, here's Joseph. He just believed. And that's why it's also important to have your kids in a strong Bible-believing church. I love love what Amy said. Man, we've got to dump what we've already learned. What the world has taught us, right? We've got to clean the slate. Okay, become like a child. Jesus, teach me. Teach me what is good, what is right, and what is pleasing, what is awesome. I mean, I don't know about you, but the stuff that I learned from the world hasn't helped me a bit. When I align myself in a relationship with God to a place of maturity, it makes all the difference. 
So for those who grew up in church, maybe this is what it looked like for you. You accepted Christ when you were little. Maybe at that point you were six. You were a child, right? Jesus said you must become like a child. And you can do this right now. You can become like a child. And boom, you're a six. If you just say, all right, I lay aside everything I've learned from this world. And I'm going to be like a child. I'm going to be a sponge. And I'm going to let God begin to speak to me. Boom, you're a six. Wouldn't that be awesome? You could do that today, right? But when you were a child and you accepted Christ as your, as, your, as your Lord and the world began to teach you things, you began to learn into those things and you began to think, oh, I don't know about Jonah and the whale anymore. I don't know about that Noah story anymore. I don't know about Mary and the virgin thing. I don't, I don't know about that. And so you start going down and so you end up being somewhere down there with the twos, maybe for the rest of your life, unless you begin to develop and have that relationship with God where you know that you know that you know the Spirit of God lives in inside of me and I can't ignore that I can't deny it it's like it's like the wind I can't see it but it's there and the wind is moving things and I know God's inside of me and so I know that this is true and so you begin to grow in that relationship with him because you begin to believe and accept and know that the things that he's saying are true and listen God didn't have us jump off some cliff to just prove something that this is some giant leap of faith to believe in Jesus there's Tons and tons of evidence of God's word. But until you until you get into it and you begin to look at it, I mean, the archaeology and stuff that's there today, we have more abundant uh, evidence for the manuscripts of the scripture than any other book. Even Shakespeare's stuff doesn't have as much manuscripts, original manuscripts as the scripture has. There's so much for you to learn and to know and to understand and to grow into maturity in Christ. It's absolutely an amazing thing. But it starts with becoming like a child and boom, you're a six and then. Are you going to go down or are you going to continue to climb and go, go up from there? That's your choice. It's your choice. And here's the thing. The temptation is that we just date God. We just date God. But God is looking for somebody that's going to marry him. He's looking for a committed relationship. We just want to have a fun, loving relationship and everything's everything's great. I've got God in my pocket and everything's going to be all right. But God, I'm going to keep you at arm's length and you stay where I want you to stay. I want you to be where you, you are and, and, and I want you there when I need you. But I'm just going to date you and everything's going to be OK because I know that God is committed to me, even though I'm not committed to him. Imagine being in a dating relationship like that, where somebody's not committing to you, but you're, you're like, my heart is wrapped around you. How horrible would that be to be in that kind of a relationship? You see, when I limit my relationship to God in a dating relationship, I find myself enjoying church when I do come and getting the benefits of Christianity and where I want God to do things in my life, but never committing to him in a real relationship. It's a problem. The Bible says this. God isn't looking for someone to date. He's looking for someone to marry. It's a theme throughout the Bible. He's looking for a bride. Someone whose heart is committed to him. That's who he's looking for. And let me ask you a question. Does he deserve that? Absolutely he does. Has he withheld himself from us? No. He's looking for someone who wants to hear his voice. Sorry. Someone to spend intimate moments with. Not someone just to go out to eat. Where he can foot the bill. He wants someone that absolutely sees him and loves him. Jesus told a story in Matthew chapter 25. And he started with these words. God's kingdom is like 
And whenever you see those words in Scripture, if you're just reading it, oh, perk up, because Jesus is about to say something that is so important. God's kingdom is like. And so he told this story, maybe you've heard it, Matthew chapter 25. It's a story about ten virgins. This is a story that Jesus made. It was a parable. And he said, you know, part of this was dealing with culture, so just go with the story. There were ten virgins, he said, and they had oil lamps, and they were to come, and they were going to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were smart. They brought extra oil, and five of them weren't smart. They didn't bring extra oil because they didn't anticipate having to wait too long. They didn't plan to wait long for the bridegroom. And as always, the bridegroom, he didn't show up on time. That's God, isn't it? For us, he's not on time. But he's always on time, isn't he? He didn't show up when they expected him. He's on his own timetable. Who does he think he is? God? So the ladies, they fell asleep. And while they were sleeping, suddenly in the middle of the night, someone yelled, he's here. He's here. Get up. Come and meet him. They jumped up and they began fixing their hair and getting themselves ready. And the the ladies that didn't bring extra oil realized, oh my goodness, my oil lamp is going out. This is a problem. And so the ladies that did, they were all ready. They brought extra oil and everything was wonderful. And, 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 And just like normal, it was everyone else's fault that I didn't bring enough oil. And so I, the, so the, the ladies, they started asking, would you guys please share? Oh, if you care about me at all, you would share your oil with me. And it's interesting that Jesus told this story and he was, he was like, no, you can't have some of my oil because if I don't have enough oil, then I'm in trouble too. And Jesus didn't berate the women for doing that. So the ladies, they took off, they went and got some more oil. And when they got back with their oil lamps full, by that time, the door was locked and they started knocking on the door and Jesus answered the door and he looked out the door and he says, do I know you? Do I know you? I don't think I know you. This relationship is what he's talking about. And Jesus said, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. James David, would you come? And what he's saying is this. God is looking for people who have planned to wait for him. Who have added to their oil. And that means you've had this relationship with him. And you have enough to spare when life is difficult. When life happens to you, that your oil doesn't run out. You know, we talked about this last week, having God's purpose and God's meaning in your life. It's going to get you through any problem and any struggle. That's the oil. And people who are committed to him. Keep their lamps lit. No matter what happens. So this parable refers to people that have good intentions to have a relationship with God, but never commit. They just stay at a two. And when the bridegroom comes, he isn't coming to look for a half-hearted girlfriend, like I said, but for one that is deeply committed to him. And notice what the bridegroom said here. When he answered the door, do I know you? He didn't look and say, oh, your oil is full now. Come on in. Glad you made it back. He didn't say, oh, I see you've been forgiven. Come on in. What do we make of this? He didn't say, well, the other ladies, that was kind of rude of them to not share their oil with you. That's not Christian like. He didn't say that. So I think what he's saying is, is you are personally responsible for your relationship with him. You're not going to be able to blame it on anybody else. You're not going to be able to count on anybody else. When you stand before him, it's going to be you and him eye to eye. And the question is going to be, do I know you? And hopefully the next statement isn't, I don't think I know you. 
hopefully the next statement is, well done, my good and faithful servant. I know you. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3, as a bridegroom is happy in his bride, so your God is happy with you. Is God happy with you today? Are you happy with him? What direction are you heading in your life? So I'm challenging you to evaluate your life today. Where are you headed? What is the direction of your life? And here's what it could look like. Just that steady growth. Don't you want that? Where do you start? Well, you become like a child. Let go of everything you've learned. And you start like a child. God, teach me. I want to know who you are, what you like, and what you don't like. And I want to understand your ways. Teach me. I want to be a sponge. Man, I remember when I was a kid, I, I, I couldn't, my parents can validate this. I could, read the, the, I could read the King James Bible and it made sense to me. <laughs> I was a sponge. Worn out a few Bibles in my life. Now it's all digital, so I don't get to do that anymore. Become a sponge. Let God's word begin to make sense to you. We've got journey one on Sunday nights. Start there. We've got journey two, journey three, and journey four. It's a progressive growth to spiritual maturity. We've got classes to help you get there. You can do this. And here's what I know. The blood of Christ is enough for you, more than enough. Like I said early in the service, God's not like the people that make our bedspreads. He doesn't do just enough. He does it abundantly. When he provided air for planet Earth, he also provided an entire solar system that supports our air. He provided water for us, not just a little bit of water, but we got a lot of water on this Earth, right? He provides for us abundantly what we need. And that's what he did for you with grace and mercy and forgiveness. So today, maybe, maybe you want to take that leap of faith. That's not much of a leap because there's so much evidence for him. But it's that relationship. You say, okay, God, I want you in my life. Just do it right where you are. Would you bow your heads? God, I want you in my life. Begin to talk to him. You talk to him. This is you and him. I'm not going to get to stand next to you in heaven when you stand before him. It's just going to be you and him. You've got to start talking to him. God, I want you in my life. I want you to be the purpose and meaning in my life. So today I invite you in and I want to accommodate for you living inside of me. I want to get to know who you are, what you like and what you don't like. And I want to begin to live in such a way that you enjoy living inside of me. And I want to walk with you and hear you. I want to hear your voice every day. I want to know you. Wash me and cleanse me from all of my sin. God, I repent of my sin. I repent of that. And all of my unrighteousness, I give it to you and I thank you. I thank you. Thank you for your cleansing. And thank you for new life. In Jesus' name.